Good evening, everyone. This is Asian Movie Pulse Interviews. I'm Sean Barry, and tonight I am joined by musician and actor Go Nakamura. Go is a proactive singer and songwriter, as well as a composer. He notably composed the music for the Bruce Lee documentary, Be Water. Go also notably made his acting debut in the Surrogate Valentine trilogy, consisting of the films Surrogate Valentine, Daylight Savings, and I Will Make You Mine. Welcome on, Go. Thanks for having me, Sean. Good to see you. Good to see you, man. How you doing? I'm doing okay. Just uh, sort of recalibrating after some events. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm good. good. Can't good complain. To hear. Yeah, good to hear, man. Mm -hmm. It's also summer. Officially, summer has hit. Indeed. Yes. Cranking so the AC. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, crank it, cranking the AC up. <laughs> So Go, um, as I mentioned before, that you've been a proactive singer and songwriter for a long time, um, and you've been especially proficient in playing guitar. Um, and you notably made your album debut with Daylight Savings. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question to you, Go, is how did this album, along with the song of the same name, come to be? Um, trying to find like a streamlined version of this but i guess there really isn't it's just kind of a long story so well, i was a yeah i was a i was a music major at berkeley college of music in the 90s and uh i went in there originally with the goal of just becoming like a like a super guitar shredder and then hopefully getting hired by a band like journey or something <laughs> you know some like major rock band just to play in front of millions of people. But uh, shortly after it going there, uh, those dreams sort of crumbled. <laughs> just, uh, I mean, I, I was still like trying to get my guitar skills as high as I could, but um, I just started getting, falling out of that kind of performance track and getting more interested in uh, composition and writing and uh like the typical track for like a four-year bachelor's degree there is uh you go there for four years you just take all guitar classes and then at the end you put on like a, a recital like a you know like an hour-long concert and i was already in bands and stuff so i i didn't feel like that was like quite what i wanted to do i wanted to do something more epic, I guess. So I found out there was another track that I could get on. It was uh, called the professional music track. And it's just sort of like, I guess the short story is you could have like a, a project. And to me, that project meant like making an album. So my, my advisor who was totally awesome, uh, kind of guided me in that direction. And then, so I had this uh, mission of like, creating an album and then sending it to him, but it took like five years. So it was like a really long detour, really angered my parents. <laughs> They're like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> so I guess in that five years, uh, this is like in the nineties. So like, you know, Nirvana and Pearl Jam and Nine Inch Nails are like all the rage and stuff. But uh, I wasn't really connecting with that music, really. So I, I kind of went backwards and I started listening to the Beatles again. Like I hadn't listened. There's like a lapse of like maybe 10 years since I would like listened to the Beatles stuff. And uh, so I, I fell really deeply into sort of my musical youth to the Beatles and uh Starting to sing and play acoustic guitar because I had been primarily playing electric guitar mm -hmm. um, during that period. And then uh, I stumbled upon uh, there's a movie called Goodwill Hunting that came out in the 90s and it had uh, Elliot Smith on the soundtrack. And he completely blew me away because he was like a combination, he was like exactly what I wanted to hear at that time. So he had like a kind of a retro sound, very influenced by the Beatles and classical music and uh, all the stuff that I loved. And I ended up 
seeing him live like a bunch kind of whenever he'd come to town i would go watch him play oh cool he's incredible yeah very mysterious too and then uh through that that was kind of a gateway to uh get into like bob dylan and jenny mitchell and singer songwriters whereas before like uh I would just listen to songs and just fast forward throughout all the lyrics because most of the stuff I was listening to was like terrible songwriting. It just had really great guitar playing in it. So I just <laughs> fast forward to the guitar solo, learn the guitar solo and then call it a day. But, you know, once I, once I started like really honing in on like the brilliant lyrics of, uh, you know, like Leonard Cohen or Amy Mann or, or uh, you know, Elliot Smith, all that wordplay was like super inspiring. So I, I went back to school, kind of independent study. Like I had a group of friends where we had nothing better to do. We would just go hang out at Borders Music and Books for like, you know, like the entire day, just like read and drink coffee and just talk about music and talk about songwriting. That was like Borders. really fun. Borders, that takes me back. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hung out with Dave Boyle at Borders a bunch too when back in the day, Barnes and Nobles and Borders. <laughs> uh, is Borders another... even a thing? Is Borders even a thing anymore? It it went out of business. Uh, Barnes and Nobles too. I think there's one. There's only a handful left, but it's a it's a reliable place to use the bathroom if you need. <laughs> <laughs> True that. Yeah. So anyway, daylight savings was like a like a collection of like uh I look at it as I look at it as me learning how to write songs basically. Um the song Daylight Savings was inspired by uh watching a Bob Dylan documentary called Don't Look Back by Pennebaker and uh Black and White. It it actually influenced Surrogate Valentine quite a bit too the feel of it and uh so i was just completely blown away by his songwriting and uh i started kind of writing really more simple tunes like chord wise more simple but um with more kind of uh poetic lyrics i guess mm -hmm. and then um so that was like really the first song that i wrote that i was happy with because i was just writing kind of garbage you know just kind of jokey songs before that um and uh yeah so that was sort of like the the pillar that i was starting to build the building upon i guess and then surrogate valentine was in that batch as well and then uh yeah once i had like what i thought was like a an okay collection of stuff like uh I saw that people were like burning CDs and selling them at shows. So I bought like a cheap CD burner and started making my own records, I guess. And hey, those five years ultimately paid off. Yeah, yeah, it's a trip. So it, it was worth it. it. It was worth the parents' frustration. Yeah, yeah. I felt like like I was completely failing and like, you know, how old was I? I was like in my twenties, late twenties, mid like, yeah, I didn't put that. I didn't put daylight savings out, savings out until like I was 30 actually. So to me, that was like super old <laughs> in hindsight. I was just a baby. <laughs> are you, um, are you ultimately, proud and satisfied with where you've come now as a musician and songwriter? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I mean, I, I am where I am. I can't really change it. I, I, like all those events led me to where I am now, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how you get places, stepping stones. Exactly. Yeah. Um, now we've talked a little bit about how you've been, you're very skilled with playing the guitar um but you also have also produced electronic music much of which is very atmospheric mm -hmm. my question to you is are there more challenges to this form of music for you compared to say playing the guitar 
Um, so like the electronic stuff, like you, you mean like the loopy stuff? Like, yeah. 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 Those are sort of like, uh, like drugs for my guitar, not drugs, but, <laughs> you know, extensions of like how to make a bigger texture kind of mm -hmm. that came out of like opening up. Like when I was playing shows, um, just playing like a, an acoustic guitar won't cut it sometimes when you're opening for like a big rock band or something or to play like a louder show, I would kind of create these arrangements around building these big textures. And uh, that directly came from seeing a guy named Joseph Arthur, who was like a singer songwriter discovered by uh, Peter Gabriel actually. And then he mm -hmm. developed this entire palette of uh, using a bunch of loopers and synchronizing them and like creating these awesome live arrangements. And I was like, I want to do that. So I stole the, the trick of singing into your guitar, the sound hole from him. I mean, yeah. in a way though, you could also look at that, you know, the same way how you've mentioned like songwriting is very like important when putting together mm -hmm. a piece of music. Like, mm -hmm. I, I mean, you could also say that applies to when you're putting together atmospheric music, like the electronic music you've done, because, you know, sometimes just a bunch of random electronic noises might just come out and people may not know what to think about. But mm -hmm. with, with what you mentioned, you create like a rhythm and it creates like a feel. And that's definitely yeah. just as important as it's it's different, but also similar to what you described about songwriting. Mm -hmm. It makes it having those devices makes it less lonely. <laughs> I guess that's that's one way to look at it. So I have like these robots that I can kind of kick on and off. Well, it's also variety, you yeah. Know? And and variety really, you know, that draws in listeners is variety. Mm. Yeah, it's like different paint brushes, sort of. So. Different paint brushes. That's actually yeah. a, that's a good way of putting it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, speaking of music that you've composed for a lot, you've composed uh, a lot of music for media, and most recently mm -hmm. you did the music score for the documentary Be Water, which mm -hmm. focuses on the life and career of martial arts star Bruce Lee. Um, was the atmosphere you created with that score also influenced by the wise nature that Bruce Lee often promoted in his involvement in acting and directing? Absolutely. Yeah, I was reading a lot of his writings and... Uh kind of try it was like a daunting subject but um we definitely had a uh like a texture in mind for the for the whole thing and uh it was basically wall-to-wall -wall music mm -hmm. so it couldn't be anything too attention grabbing um but flowing you know to help complimentary complimentary yeah help move the story along and stuff. So, yeah, it was fun. It was like one of the most uh, fulfilling projects I've ever done. Fantastic. Yeah. Are there any other like particular icons of like Asian entertainment that you would totally consider doing a music score like that? As to say, like there's also a pl plenty of other, you know, acclaimed martial artists as well mm -hmm. or just just artists in general i mean are there any uh other you'd be interested in like composing music for that come to mind um like miyazaki or something like a animation miyazaki. would be incredible <laughs> yeah and why miyazaki uh amongst all of the uh anime directors if you don't mind me asking just the whimsy and like the sort of uh, the breadth of imagination and uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, it'd be a fun vibe to to explore. Fantastical. Yeah. I, I did a I did score a video game that had that vibe actually and they were asking for that kind of music, that kind of vibe that was like part of the the target sound, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well hey the the B the B Water score came out fantastic, so hopefully we'll see more scores like that from you in the future. Yeah, I, I'd love to do them. Um, 
now to kind of segue, mm-hmm. I, I think this is now a good time to talk about you um, as an actor. So regarding acting, I figure we now talk about probably what you're very well known for, which is for starring in the surrogate Valentine trilogy, where you played a fictional version of yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, how You mentioned the Bob Dylan documentary, uh, Don't Look Back, was an influence, but how did the initial idea come about with Surrogate Valentine? And did you think, I guess my, well, I'll, I'll start this way. What, what was the initial idea? How did the initial idea come up for Surrogate Valentine? Um, it just, it came about from hanging out with Dave and just joking off, joking around with him. Um, the original idea was, uh, well, I met Dave at a film festival, like in 2009. It all happened super fast. Um, mm-hmm. So we hit it off and then he was uh, touring a movie called White on Rice at the time. And we were, yes. we were having dinner. He's like, hey, hey, uh, you want to write a song for the to help me promote the movie? I was like, yeah, sure. And then so I, I wrote this very wordy kind of Bob Dylan like song. You can find the video <laughs> on YouTube. It's uh, it's called White on Rice, and uh, it's pretty silly. But so he made a video for it. We were just walking around San Francisco, and he was just filming it in black and white. And I, little did I know that that was sort of like an audition to do this project called Surrogate Valentine, which initially was supposed to be a, a touring filmmaker kind of chasing mm-hmm. around this high school uh, flame, old flame. So he just kind of replaced it with a musician. So I'm kind of playing like a version of Dave, actually. Interesting. So you are you feel like you're playing Dave Boyle in a way? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> sort of like a merging of, of both of us. Mm-hmm. Um, what was it like though playing a fiction or actually before I ask that, did you think that there were going to be two follow up movies to Surrogate Valentine? <laughs> no, no way. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's a miracle that even one of them happened. And, uh, it's, it's just a trip that we, uh, we continued it. You know, like when we were first talking about it, um, he had me watch uh, the 400 blows. Oh, Truffaut. Yeah. So you know how that kind of char- that follows that one character when he's a kid up to where he's an adult. There's like a bunch right. of movies. I can't remember the name of the actor. I think it's uh, Antoine Duenel is the the character. Mm-hmm. Anyway, you can Google it. But uh, I was like, oh, that's a really cool idea, and then we ended up doing it. That's uh. That's the thing about Dave. He'll say he's going to do something and then he does it. That's It's like super inspiring. I love it. He follows through with it. Yeah. And That's what right. was it like? And what was it like for you to play a fictional version of yourself while still incorporating a lot of your real personality into the character? It was really weird. <laughs> it's surreal. Uh, I didn't know anything about acting. Like, um, I still don't. But, you know, like I, I started to think of it as like re- same as recording like a like an album. You have to be like in a very specific focal point and you have to be where you sound the best in front of the mic or something. And you're in rhythm with all this choreography kind of. So, but each time like I was, it took a while to get back into the, the groove of things. So we had really good editors. That's <laughs> saved by the edit. <laughs> you look. Do you look back though? And are you proud with how it turned out ultimately? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the, you're always going to think, "Oh, I should have done this, or I could have been better." But you know, it's like you just have to kind of accept what it came out to be. And mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm ultimately I'm proud of it. I'm kind of I'm just astonished that it even happened. <laughs> I mean, yeah. a, a trilogy, three movies, like, that's pretty incredible. Yeah, it's a mir- it takes a miracle just to make even one movie, let alone, let alone three. So. Right. Yeah. Were you, 
Were you happy with how? I know this sounds silly. Were you happy with how Go's story concluded? In <laughs> I will in I will make you mine. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's uh, it was a really great flip, and it was good that there was that lapse of ten years right. between daylight savings and that one. Um, yeah. I know. I I know. I asked. Um, I asked Ye Ming and Lin this when I interviewed them. Um, between the gap of daylight savings and I will make you mine, was there a point where you thought that maybe there wasn't going to be a third movie? Um, I, I was open to it. Um, I think, uh, Dave was telling me, he's like, oh, you should write the last one. You should direct the last one. I was like, all right, man. (laughs) But then, you know, I, I don't have any skills of writing a script or directing a movie. So it fell by the way side for sure. And then, so when Lynn emailed me or texted me, she's like, I wrote a script. I was super surprised and excited. I was like, yeah, yeah. Count me in. Of course. <laughs> so got the band back together. And does it, it must feel a little surreal now, now that the story is complete. Yeah like a whole journey now it's like you've been on a long journey and now that journey is is over mm-hmm. but it's, people uh, but people still come back to you know experience that journey from the beginning especially now that yeah. the entire trilogy is accessible via streaming services mm-hmm. yeah it's great like I, honestly i don't really think about it that much like uh every once in a while i'll wake up and i'll just be like whoa that was what a what a crazy experience like that's a, that's like an incredible privilege to have been a part of that and even today like this morning someone texted me ra- messaged me randomly was like hey man i saw i saw the movies you're grading them and so i was like oh that's that makes me really happy that like it's still like living out there it's really cool yeah that's 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 great you know yeah. it it shows you know I mean, are you interested in doing more acting in the future? I'm definitely open to it. I'm not actively pursuing it, but if someone wants me to join something, I'm I'm down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Get my acting chops back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you you definitely did when you appeared in I Will Make You Mine. Let's see. <laughs> Remember, there was that that long gap. And you just yeah. got you just got but you just got right back into the got right back into the role like it yeah, was, it was like it was time hadn't passed <laughs> yeah it felt well we're all such good friends that it felt more like a reunion and mm-hmm. uh it's just really fun uh, the sets are always super fun dave and, oh, yeah. and, and yeah Ming, just kind of joking around and i mean it's they're very they're very focused but um we we definitely have fun so there's a comfortable atmosphere on the set absolutely yeah absolutely. as a as opposed to sometimes there can be like a sense of intimidation when on a film set because you want to fulfill expectations but mm-hmm. so you just yeah. felt relaxed yeah there's a lot of what? trust amongst us so well hopefully we'll see hopefully more acting opportunities will come up yeah Hire me. <laughs> <laughs> Hire Go Nakamura. Um, this might be quite a big leap question, but what are your feelings regarding the current state of the music industry and film industry? Um, I'm just puzzled. I'm I'm always puzzled though. Like, um, I've never been on a record label or any had any like kind of like corporate backing. So I'm always sort of on the uh, on the sidelines, I feel, or like the, uh, what's the word? On the fringe, <laughs> mm-hmm. I guess. And uh, I, I feel kind of the same way I did when I was like 14, just writing songs and recording them onto my four track cassette and like, you know, maybe like sending stuff out. This is pre-internet, just like, giving cassettes to friends and just doing it for myself and for my friends. 
So, um, especially with all the streaming stuff and all the writer strike stuff now, it's it's uh, always in flux. Everyone's just trying to make a buck. But um, yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of following it, but I'm not like letting it like really affect what I do. Um, you're you're casual. You're casual. You're casual about it. Yeah, casual about it. Right. But concerned. <laughs> well, hopefully yeah. things turn out for the better. I, th- yeah. I think a lot of artists are concerned whether they be like head on in the industry or independently producing the work mm-hmm. it is definitely a, a surreal time for creative yeah. minds so we will win we will win <laughs> yes exactly well go um thank you so much for taking the time to appear on asian movie pulse interviews and thank you for coming on for the uh, show thanks for having me of course. Um, one last question for you, Go. Are there any projects that you'd like to promote? Yeah. Um, I can't really name them because they haven't been announced, but I scored a uh, like a pretty major documentary that'll come out um, in the fall, I think. And then uh, I'm about to start another uh, feature-length score for a uh, like a comedy sort of oh. like uh along the lines of a like a Dave Boyle-ish kind of mm-hmm. movie so super excited to start that all righty yeah well, I look for, I look look forward to seeing those awesome um and for all those who are listening the surrogate Valentine trilogy is available on multiple streaming services including Amazon Prime and a lot of Go Nakamura's music is also available on many platforms, including Bandcamp, Spotify, and Apple Music. So definitely give his music a listen and give the Surrogate Valentine trilogy a watch. Also give Be Water a watch, an excellent documentary on the life and legacy of Bruce Lee. Well, Go, thank you so much for appearing on the show. Thanks and so much, Sean. Thank- of course. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. And this is Asian Movie Pulse Interviews. Tuning out. All right.